Hi, everyone. We're so happy to welcome you today to our discussion, Unpacking Weight Stigma Challenges and Solutions in Higher Levels of Care with myself and Dr. Erin Harrop. Um, we'll start with some brief introductions. Um, Dr. Erin Harrop is an assistant professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work and licensed medical social worker. Their research centers on the intersection of weight stigma, eating disorders, and patient healthcare experiences. They approach their work from a patient-centered, lived experience, intersectional, social justice-informed, fat liberation lens. Erin's clinical work involves group work to support patients in deconstructing diet culture and ingrained weight stigma. They also conduct trainings at the provider level, introducing interprofessional clinicians to weight inclusive practices that honor patients' unique intersecting identities. Welcome, Dr. Hera. And I am okay. Kate Stefani. <laughs> um, I worked in the field of eating disorders for more than 15 years with experience treating clients at all levels of care. They have a master's of social work and a master's of arts and art therapy from NYU. I'm passionate about creating an affirming, safe, and creative space for therapy using trauma-informed and social justice frameworks. And as a clinical lead at Within Health, I lead our programming for both within university and our professionals. So we're both super happy to have everyone here today. I didn't know you did art therapy, Kate. This is perfect yeah. with us talking about art therapy or art today. <laughs> Definitely. So a little bit about our frame for discussion today. Um, we definitely want to hold that so many of our clients and so many um, people that perhaps need care and don't have access to care hold multiple marginalized identities. So we're going to kind of come at this from that intersectional framework, um, kind of keeping in mind our own identities. Um, I hold a lot of privilege as a straight-sized, white, educated, provider. Um, Aaron, I don't know if there's anything you want to share. Uh, yeah, I also hold um, multiple privileged identities in terms of being white and educated and middle class. Um, and then also some marginalized identities in terms of being a queer person, being non-binary, um, and being on the fat spectrum. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the term fat spectrum, but that's a term we use to describe um, people who are in larger bodies and to recognize the fact that um, people who are in smaller, larger bodies, so maybe people kind of at the very bottom of plus sizes, that they have a lot more privilege and access to resources in our world and people at the higher end of the spe fat spectrum um, experience greater oppression and lack of resources and lack of access. So within that spectrum, I'm what they call mid fat, which means um, that I'm not a small fat, kind of the, the folks that can kind of go in and out of maybe uh, the upper end of, of, quote, of straight size stores into plus size stores. So I'm solidly kind of plus, plus size. However, um, I am not in the, what we call the super fat spectrum, um, which is a place where people have uh, more significant limitations in terms of access and, and discrimination. So um, I wanted to just give that context about my body, my body size, um, as we're talking about issues related to weight stigma so that um, that you could understand the, the position that I'm speaking from. I'm also a neuro spicy individual um, and uh, a, a clinician and a researcher when it comes to eating disorders. So I think that's probably sufficient for today. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we're both comfortable saying we bring our own lived experience to the work. Um, and so we see things through that frame as well. Absolutely. Okay. So one of the super exciting things about our chat today is that Dr. Harrop is going to be sharing some client artwork with us to help us through this discussion. Um, so we can jump right in. Yeah, so as we're talking today, we thought that we would um, just kind of walk through different uh, patient stories in relation to experiences in higher level of care and also in relation to attempts to get higher level of care, kind of recognizing that um, many people with eating disorders who might merit care, who could benefit from higher levels of care, don't necessarily have 
um, as straightforward of access. Um, and then we'll also be kind of hitting on um, how weight stigma kind of manifests in these settings and what we can do to try and um, combat it and or um, lessen its impact. So um, this this first, and we're gonna be just kind of like showing you some artwork, talking about some themes and just sharing some of the stories that we hear from um, my research participants. So these are all um, artwork that was created during a research study for people who had atypical anorexia, which is anorexia in a higher weight body. Um, and so we're just gonna kind of talk through some of the themes and stories related to it. I wanted, I just put this first image here to start out with, and this is actually um, artwork from a participant who um, had not been able to access higher level of care, had tried um, multiple times and because of their identity as a parent with young children. So um, they were not and a single parent with young children. They were not able to figure out how to access care for themselves at a higher level um, while being able to take care of their um, kind of responsibilities at home with their kids. Um, and they also, you know, as part of that, they also had um, kids with disabilities um, th that required higher levels of care. So when we're thinking, or not higher levels of care, that required like, like more uh, treatments and kind of assistance during the week. And so when we're thinking about um, some of the issues we can run into when patients get to higher levels of care, I also want us to think about some of the things that keep patients from arriving. Um, this patient also, when they had reached out to, um, I don't know if it was their insurance or an eating disorder advocacy organization about their concerns about their eating disorder. Um, they had been matched with an eating disorder treatment program. And as they were matched, they were told, you know, you really, your symptoms really align with um, a restrictive eating disorder, which fits. Um, and I will put the term restrictive eating disorder in quotes here because I, I don't love it. I think it leaves some people out. Um, but what they meant by that is that this patient was experiencing symptoms of anorexia. Um, however, they what they told this patient was, you know, we have an anorexia group and a bulimia group, and we have a group for people in larger bodies. And we don't really think that you'd fit in the group for people with larger bodies because that's focused in around binge eating. You don't have symptoms of bulimia, so we don't think you would fit there. You would fit best in the group for people struggling with anorexia, but we don't think you'd really feel comfortable because your body size is, is uh, larger compared to the other people who would be there. And so um, this patient um, just did not chose at that point in time not to follow up with care um, because from their perspective, um, there wasn't really a space for them um, within their treatment system. So the art that you're seeing here um, in white, uh, in the white letters is um, things that this person had heard from their healthcare provider when um, they had been in healthcare uh, a treatment appointments. So I don't believe you, you need to work harder. Losing weight will fix that problem. Your pain is in your head. Um, and in blue um, are the things that they wish they had heard from their um, healthcare providers. I hear you, let's try something, you matter. I can see how much pain you're in. Um, one of the reasons why I love this image is uh, because as providers, like these blue, these blue phrases, like you don't need a clinical degree in social work to, to, <laughs> to um, be able to learn these phrases, right? Let's try something, you matter, I believe you. You're frustrated and reasonably so. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to, to highlight sometimes how far we are from, <laughs> from good clinical rapport and how easy some of these phrases can be if we adopt them. Yeah, I, that's a great point, Erin. And <clears throat> I think really important that we're holding that frame. I, I know one of the things that we talked about was, right, who even has access to higher level of care beyond like the barriers, like the maybe day-to-day -day barriers of family and responsibility and work and um, school, but who can even get an authorization from an insurance company? And mm -hmm. I know our team has had some reactions to the new ICD-10 codes that came out this week with the specifiers. Um, so lots and lots and lots of barriers 
Mm -hmm. um, especially for clients in larger bodies. Absolutely. All right. So one of the things that people, even people who were able to access higher levels of care, one of the themes that kind of arose from them is that when they got to higher levels of care, they felt like they didn't fit, fit in the treatment box. They didn't fit in the diagnostic box that they were given. Um, and so that you can see this artwork here from Uki, um, which is the one, and I'm, I'm using names. These names are all pseudonyms. None of them are real names of, of clients. These are just the names that people chose um, for themselves. Um, and uh, this first image shows, you know, a, a young person kind of shoved into this box and they're just not fitting. You can see their knees are kind of poking up above the, the top of the box. Um, and they describe this as, you know, just feeling like they really didn't find a place where they fit within um, eating disorder diagnoses um, as larger bodied clients. And so, um, it, you know, a similar story is, is in the last slide when we talked about, you know, which group should this person attend? Um, and this person said, you know, you know, it felt like I didn't fit in any of the diagnostic criteria and when I was trying to get help and then I was blamed by treatment providers for hurting myself or for, you know, for, for um, my eating disorder when I was asking for help, but the help, you know, there wasn't a really a box big enough um, for my experience. Um, and I will say too, um, this experience of feeling like not belonging wasn't just influenced by people's body size when they were larger than their peers, but it was also influenced by other factors like gender um sexuality and race and culture um both of these uh images of artwork were done by by pop participants um and for uki the one who drew this this box here she also described she was a, a, a native alaska woman she also described how in one of her treatment centers um one of the interventions that they did was they asked in a group for everyone to draw their quote unquote family totem um and for Uki, her response was, um, you know, totem is a sacred art and it's really tribe specific. And I don't feel comfortable drawing a family totem when that's not the tradition of my tribe. Um, and she didn't even critique the treatment center for, for doing this intervention. She just said, I would like to not participate because it doesn't align with my values and my culture. Um, and when she said that, the uh, treatment provider that was leading the group said, well, you could put on your big girl panties and do the activity anyway. Um, and Uki responded by saying that she wasn't going to engage in something that um, didn't align with her values. Um, and, you know, as a consequence, she was put on a one on one for 24 hours uh, for failure to participate in group. Um, and I, I just I bring that up because um, these identities that we we hold as patients and the identities that our clients hold, um, they, they intersect. We're not just one thing like a larger bodied patient or a native Alaska patient uh, or a queer patient or a non-binary patient. Like we, we are all these things at once. And um, for many uh, participants in the work that I've done, the more marginalized identities that they held, um, the less they felt as if they belonged in treatment spaces. Um, this artwork here on the side is uh, from an African-American participant in the study. And actually um, she was one who was not able to access higher level of care. Um, we did have other African-American clients um, in the study. Uh, and one of them spoke about being the only and this is a um, Carter, he's a, a, a black trans man, and he spoke about being the only black patient that he ever saw when he was in higher levels of care, and he experienced multiple episodes of higher levels of care. And he said it was, it was very othering to be in these situations where um, he always felt like the odd one out and always felt as if um, his experience was somehow less important. Um, particularly than the young white girls that he was frequently in treatment groups with. Um, and so just, you know, acknowledging that these identities intersect and, and necessarily influence each other. Those are some 
really striking stories and it, it's just amazing right I one of the things we're obviously talking about is the harm we can do as providers and we will get to kind of what we can do better as well so it's it's not all bad news but um the the punitive response to a client setting a boundary which is something we should be encouraging and celebrating right that's a very appropriate boundary like mm -hmm. awful that that client was put in that situation in the first place but to then punish that real self-advocacy um we're just yeah, moving in the wrong direction a lot in higher levels of of care because it can be difficult to tell and i you know, I'll say this as both a, a patient and a provider, it can be difficult to tell sometimes um, where a refusal might be coming from, if it is motivated by the eating disorder, if it is motivated by a place of recovery. Um, and something that I saw kind of over and over in many of these interviews was that many of the patients, especially patients who were kind of repeat flyers in uh, treatment centers or patients who had like a, a more clinical background, they maybe had higher education in a related field to eating disorders, um, they often showed really high levels of self-advocacy, which um, for me, uh, with my own biases, surprised me a bit, um, because that's often something we have to really struggle to help our clients learn how to do in the eating disorder recovery realm. Um, however, oftentimes that self-advocacy was met with suspicion, um, or it was met with providers saying things like, you know, well, this is a good opportunity for you to practice distress tolerance, right? Like, um, <laughs> you know, here's an example of something not going your way. Let's try, let's try, uh, you know, sitting with that and tolerating it. And while distress tolerance um, is an extremely important skill in recovery, um, when it comes to things like discrimination or stigma, I think those are times where as as providers or treatment centers, we need to to stop and pause and uh, reflect as to um, what are we really promoting in terms of a recovery skill? Because teaching a client to adapt to discrimination or to adapt to stigma um, could actually be you know, harming that client, in in my opinion, um, as opposed to encouraging that self advocacy um, or that resistance to oppressive norms. So, absolutely, and it goes back to that first image you showed of just really wanting to hear, "I believe you." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So, kind of a, a associated with. Um, these experiences or these feelings of not belonging in treatment. Um, patients also reported feeling quite alone at times. Um, that was often because of the ways that they saw themselves as different from their peers. Um, oftentimes that was because uh, they identified as being higher weight compared to their peers. Um, but as we talked about in the last slide, other identities sometimes contributed to that, that feeling of of being alone, of being isolated, of being not a part of the group. Um, and one thing I wanted to just point out here too is that many of the things that we're talking about in the context of weight stigma also apply to our thin clients, right? These aren't, these, these feelings of like, I don't belong or I feel alone in my eating disorder. Um, these aren't things that are necessarily unique to a higher weight experience. However, they can be compounded by the higher weight experience. So here we have um, a client who, um, I don't know, so you have this kind of scary looming e eating disorder image um, in this first image. Um, that's kind of how they drew their eating disorder, that kind of scary, almost like Spider-Man and Venom looking uh, villain there in the background. And, and in the foreground, um, there's this tiny image of a person just kind of hunched over with her uh, hands covering her face, just feeling quite alone and unable to access kind of this happier world that's around her because of this kind of tunnel vision on that eating disorder. And then um, next here, uh, next to her is um, Art. And this was actually Art from one of the older clients in our study. She was in her mid fifties um, uh, when I interviewed her and had been in and out of treatment for uh, for years. Um, and um, 
something that she repeatedly came back to was that feeling invisible or less important um, when she was uh, getting treatment. And I did with her, I wanted, I don't have um, any images in here specifically of food, um, but I did want to kind of hit on um, some of the stories that people told about um, food and meal plans and weight restoration when they were in higher levels of care, because that was absolutely a, a theme that people discussed in their interviews. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened for people who were higher weight when they went into higher levels of care is that sometimes clinics didn't um, put them on weight restoration plans when they entered, even when they had experienced significant weight suppression prior to admitting uh, to a higher level of care. So for example, um, one of the participants in this study, uh, Ari, who was a young Mexican-American woman, uh, she had lost 20% of her body weight before entering a higher level of care, um, actually had to go on leave from her undergraduate college in order to, to get treatment for her eating disorder. When she entered her um, uh, partial hospitalization program, they put her on a weight maintenance plan. Um, so they accounted for no weight gain in recovery, and they kind of treated her eating disorder as if it had been kind of this like, you know, thwarted Weight Watchers, <laughs> weight watchers issue, you know, you know um, it, because she had started out at a higher weight and she had experienced this, this large weight loss, but because she was still at a place where um, they didn't think she needed to gain weight, they kept her intentionally in a weight suppressed state. And what she experienced um, physically as a result of that was that her, as her metabolism came back on board with getting a, uh, a, you know, with getting increased nutrition from entering a higher level of care, she experienced all of those things that we do in recovery when we start a refeeding process. So her metabolism increased, her hunger cues came back. She found herself ravenous all the time, but because they weren't keeping up with her caloric needs for that healing process, she just constantly felt as if she was hungry and not satisfied. Um, when she did ask for um, additional food, um, so there was, her peers were often given like protein shakes after food, after meals and things like that as part of their supplement and weight restoration plans. She was not. Um, there was one time where she was extremely hungry. She, so she asked for a protein shake after a meal and they told her that she wasn't allowed to have one. And she said, well, why can this, patient have one and I can't. And they said, well, she's in weight restoration and you're not. Um, and she said, well, then why am I, you know, why am I so hungry all the time? And they said that they thought it was because she was having the urge to binge. And so for her, um, that actually, like that, that binging uh, behavior was not a part of her story. She was not experiencing binges at the time. Um, but essentially for her, what happened in treatment was that her hunger was pathologized you know, the normal hunger that we try to encourage patients to pay attention to in order to engage in more intuitive eating and, um, and sufficient eating, um, that was pathologized for her. And that spurred so much distrust in her own body and her own sense of her ability to tell when she was hungry or when she was full. Um, and the other thing that happened for her is that um, they also encouraged her over and over to start exercising whenever she would complain about her hunger. And that for her, again, kind of fed that um, restrictive anorexic mindset that she was struggling with. Yeah. We also heard from, oh, go ahead, Kate. No, I was just saying, of course, right. We're just setting that client up for failure. Mm -hmm. And all the skills that she will need in a lower level of care, right? The skills that you will need in order to like understand like how much hunger am I feeling and how much food would be appropriate as a response to that hunger um, and how do I nourish for exercise as opposed to using exercise as like a diversion for my hunger all of the skills that she was needing to, in order to successfully step down to a lower level of care were she was kind of being cheated out of those recovery skills and she was losing the opportunity to practice those skills in a more supportive environment of higher levels of care. Absolutely. And that continual encouragement to uh, the invalidation itself and then the encouragement for her to join in on that invalidation. 
think yeah. that's where we see people stuck, feeling stuck on a meal plan. Well, how can I get off this meal plan? I constantly want to eat more than it. That must mm-hmm. be, I'm yes. told that yeah. that's, yeah. And this, um, this picture here, the collage one, um, that I mentioned was from one of the older clients. This was a client who, um, she was a triathlete. She was very high performing athlete. Um, and she was actually kind of typically in a a lower body weight. She was never under that anorexia threshold, but she kind of flirted with it in the, um, in the depths of her disorder. Um, and she experienced, you know, as a, as a, woman in her mid fifties, she experienced a lot of medical complications from her long-term eating disorders. So, you know, uh, kidney issues, heart issues, um, uh, fracture, multiple fractures, um, from the exercise component of her eating disorder. And when she admitted, um, to an inpatient level of care, so, uh, you know, above residential and an actual hospitalized facility because of the medical complications that she was experiencing from her uh, atypical anorexia. Um, when the, on her first day, when she was admitting, she met with her dietitian and the dietitian who we were told was new to the field, um, asked her at her intake interview, how much more weight she wanted to lose in her eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she remember, she described to me, she was like, you know, I actually had like a bigger number in mind of how much I wanted to say, how much weight I wanted to lose, but I knew I was entering eating disorder treatment. So I, I told her like, oh, only 10 pounds. (laughs) Um, so she kind of like lowered that number to try and get the dietitians buy-in and the dietitian said, looked her kind of up and down and said, oh, I think that's doable. And this was the, you know, her, her first few hours of inpatient and she was being told that in inpatient for her anorexia, they could help her lose weight. Um, and for this client, she was eating an extremely restrictive diet at that point. And so the message that was sent to her was one, her body was still unacceptable. She was still too high weight, despite the amount of weight that, that was lost. And two, that no one actually believed her suffering or her eating disorder, right? That if if the dietitian had actually believed the the caloric level that was her current intake, um, she likely would not have uh, recommended that weight loss be continued. And, and the other thing I'll highlight with that story is just that oftentimes in higher levels of care, we're working with new providers and new clinicians, many of whom don't have as much training with eating disorders. And so it's so important to have really um, consistent and good mentoring and training when we're uh, working with with new cl- clinicians in order to help them kind of minimize harm and kind of teach them the tricks and and strategies that eating disorders use in order to get providers on board with the disorder. You know, so much of my work as a, as a provider um, and a therapist in working with eating disorders is about not, not colluding with the eating disorder at any point in time, you know, um, and not, and trying to keep that recovery mindset in the center. Yeah. This goes, I, I think it's a beautiful transition um, into these next images and, and thinking about weight focused care and right. What we're prescribing to clients in higher weight bodies is mm-hmm. disordered eating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think often the assumption is in eating disorder care that if someone's in a larger body that they must struggle with binge eating or quote unquote overeating or emotional eating quote unquote fyi i think it would be super disordered if we were never had emotions related to our eating right like that to me sounds pretty <laughs> pretty dangerous i so i don't i dislike when we pathologize emotional eating i think it's absolutely within the realm of of normal attuned eating for us to feel emotions when we eat food and for us to even use foods to comfort us you know i um i often use the example of you know um one of my comfort meals is my grandmother's malto meal with canned peaches you know because that whenever i spent the the night at her house as a child she i would wake up in the morning and she would be making you know the same we alternated between canned peaches and canned pears but um you know, it was her home home canned fruit that she had and this malto meal that she would make for me and my siblings. And um, 
whenever I eat that meal, like I feel that sense of love and compassion and holding that my grandmother had for me. Um, and so it's actually one of my recovery skills is that when I'm feeling unworthy, when I'm feeling disgusting, when I'm feeling triggered in some way with my eating disorder, that's one of my recovery skills is to make a comfort meal that reminds me of being treasured and precious to someone like my grandmother. So um, yeah, just tossing that in as we're talking about higher weight and binging and emotional eating that um, really ex helping our, our clients and our patients see the value in being emotionally connected and socially connected to food, um, especially when in bigger bodies, when that has been pathologized so much for them, can be really an important part of the recovery process. Well, if you think about too, how much food and culture are connected, whether it's yeah. right American culture and celebrating mm -hmm. right, a birthday party with cake and ice cream um, or any kind of other connection of food and culture, it's so intertwined, whether it's like a happy celebration or comfort at a memorial, there's mm -hmm. so many ways that food is woven in. And so I love that you point that out that, right, like we do emotionally eat. That is part of normal eating. That's not something we want to stop. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, kind of transitioning and kind of like in the same line, um, a lot of patients in higher weight bodies talked about this really weight focused approach to their care, you know, where there was a lot of stress or anxiety about how much their bodies weighed and how much weight they might gain in recovery. Um, they also talked about receiving weight loss messages in higher levels of care. Um, even when they their diagnosis of atypical anorexia was actually recognized by the care center, but there was this, still this, um, this concern that if they gained weight or gained weight too quickly, which many of them, and I'm putting too quickly in, in quotes here, um, <laughs> which many of them did, that there was then this automatic worry that maybe the patient was binging or maybe the patient needed to start exercising immediately. Um, you can see here in this um, this red uh, and orange colored one off to the right, there's a, there's a client who's trying to climb this incredibly steep cliff um, with just a, a one little rope uh, holding them. And at the top, you can see this doctor with a clipboard kind of looking down at them and the doctor is saying, you should join Weight Watchers. I've had a lot of patients have success with that. If you don't get this under control now, things will get out of control and you'll have weight problems as an adult. We're not sure why you're not having a cycle. This is a menstrual cycle, but it'll probably resolve itself. I'm sensing some ambivalence. Do you do any cardio? Um, so you can see here that many of the messages that they were receiving and, and some of these messages, they're you know, recalling from pediatric visits, you can um, see that. And others were also, for this patient, echoed to them um, in higher levels of care. So this patient in particular had struggled with atypical anorexia since her adolescent years. She entered treatment for it as an adult, received higher levels of care, actually in a higher level of care, was diagnosed with diabetes. Um, and oftentimes we associate diabetes with being higher weight or weighing quote unquote too much. And so for her, that was a very difficult diagnosis to receive. Um, we also know that, that diabetes and, and um, blood sugar regulation are impacted by things like restriction, right? Um, and so it's not just a person. It, and we also know that people, thin people and fat people struggle with both types of diabetes. <laughs> um, and so, um, while she was in inpatient, she actually was referred to an endocrinologist specialist to help handle her case and understand how they could do the renourishment and weight restoration process while in the midst of her diabetes treatment. Um, and that endocrinologist actually recommended a, a restrictive diet and weight loss for her while she was in a partial hospitalization level of care. Um, and she, she recalled, she said, she told the doctor, I don't know how to hold my eating disorder recovery um, advice with your advice that I should restrict and lose weight. Um, you could tell that that client had had a lot of therapy, right? If that's the way that she's framing her, her question. Um, and she said that when she told the endocrinologist that the endocrinologist kind of backed off and started complimenting her clothing, um, but didn't really 
revisit how to actually do her diabetes care in the context of regular eating and, and nutritional rehabilitation. And so thinking about these mixed messages that people got um, and that, you know, this, this other uh, image off to the side, I uh, just wanted to highlight one other issue in terms of uh, intersectional issues. So this was a, a trans woman who talked about um, how all, so much of her health care in general just seemed to be focused on her weight, whether that was for a bloody nose or a sore throat, um, bronchitis, depression, all of it kind of came back to these um, recommendations for exercise, dieting, or weight loss. And she also pointed out that something that was really confusing for her as a trans woman is that um, in treating her gender dysphoria, the recommendations from treatment providers is to change her body as much as she could to align with that um, that gender ideal that that um, that that she she knew that she was. Um, however, in eating disorder treatment, so much of the therapy is focused on accepting your body as it is without changing your body. And she said that for her as a trans woman, trying to reconcile those two contradicting messages of change your body, but don't change your body, you know, accept your weight, but lose weight, um, that those were uh, really made recovery confusing. Sure. And, and then who are you left to trust or believe? Um mm -hmm because there's so many conflicting messages and it, no one's coming back to her experience. And mm -hmm. what does she find affirming? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I would mention with this too, that in terms of weight focused care for, for many of our, our trans and non-binary clients, because there are so many barriers to care for higher weight people, Often um, those BMI requirements for um, hormone treatments for, which we don't see as often, most people can get hormones, but sometimes hormones are restricted based on body weight. Um, and especially for surgical affirmation surgeries, um, that can be a huge motivator for people to continue on in their eating disorder. And actually this, uh, this participant shared that um, she dove like head first back into her eating disorder um, when she was scheduled for her bottom surgery because she knew she had to stay below this one BMI cutoff. And she had made a promise to herself, you know, I will start eating again and I will re-engage with recovery, but I'm not going to do it until after I've been able to have my surgery. And so, you know, again, um, our clients are facing huge contradicting pressures from healthcare, often forcing them uh, like to fight against health in order to receive the the surgeries and the, the transition care that they need yeah this is kind of just going along with some of what we've talked about that oftentimes participants felt like they weren't heard by providers or that providers kind of minimize their eating disorders um and sometimes like you can see here with this kind of this is the fern gully uh villain in case any of you are recognizing this and not able to identify it. Um, this is the Fern Gully villain with a doctor's coat on. Um, and this, this patient described that sometimes her providers in treatment actually became the voice of her eating disorder. Um, and that's a humbling kind of indictment for, for us. Um, and, you know, something that I, I often ask myself when I'm leading groups is like, how, like, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, right? Like, am I, am I colluding with the eating disorder at any point? Right. Is there, is there some, am I fearing weight or weight gain for my client more than I'm fearing their eating disorder? Am I, um, am I willing to accept maybe some disordered restriction or some disordered exercise because this client looks larger to me than I than another client do I accept it more readily in a larger body client than I do in a thinner body client and why and so much of this is like baked into our society it's baked into our understanding of health from a very young age um, it's baked into our training programs as, as healthcare professionals across a range of fields 
including things like social work, where we're not even weight specialists. <laughs> we're, we're not doing dietetics. We're not doing exercise. We're not trained in exercise work with our clients. And yet um, this stigma uh, still kind of permeates. So um, I think anytime I'm working with clients, that's one of those reflections that I'm asking myself as a provider, um, even doing this work full time, it still sneaks in. It still sneaks in. Absolutely. Well, right. It's hard when you're swimming through it every day in the healthcare system by fighting with insurance, right. And being constrained to use IBW instead of BAW. And yes, how are we getting clients the care they need when we're working within the constraints of those systems? I'm going to keep us moving as much as I love these images because I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions and I want to get us to see all the amazing artwork that you have to share. Yeah, with this one, I just wanted the, I called it get used to seeing me. You can see that that image is in the bottom right corner um, over that body. It says get used to seeing me. And this client just talked about feeling kind of under-prioritized in higher levels of care as if her experience as a larger bodied person didn't seem to merit as much panic or concern as some of her thinner um, peers. And as a result, she said that she received a lot of conflicting messages about refeeding and how much she should eat. And, you know, we I need to gain weight and I need to restore my nutrition, but I also need to not eat too much and not recover too much and not gain too much weight. And she said that in short, she felt as if her treatment experience was setting her up for the next treatment experience. And that's why she emphasized this message of get used to seeing me. Yeah. And so I know <laughs> you, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Kate. <laughs> So we had talked about this as kind of a fundamental cycle that many of our clients in larger bodies end up struggling with, that they're, um, if able to access treatment at all, admitted to a lower level of care under the assumption that they're more stable medically or further along, um, many times leading to underfeeding or a lack of full restoration, right? Like that client you mentioned being on a maintenance meal plan when clearly there was so much more work to be done and healing to be done. Um, leading to premature discharge, being discharged before they're at a stable place in recovery, right? And we just loop back in, in this kind of mm -hmm. ongoing cycle. And then clients are labeled as resistant, right? Oh, mm -hmm. you're treatment resistant. Why you've had so many admissions. Why hasn't any of this helped? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that connection to resist treatment resistance. I absolutely see that. So now we get to go into some of the, the better news. <laughs> Yeah, with this, I just I just wanted to give an example of how powerful it can be when we do have weight inclusivity in treatment. So you can see this one image um, on the, uh, and this is actually um, a client who did not make it to a higher level of care. So they actually stayed in a outpatient for the duration of their recovery experience. And you can see on the left is an image of their experiences in healthcare um, uh, kind of outside of eating disorder treatment, focusing on kind of doctor's visits and that kind of thing, where this patient was, you know, told over and over that they were fat and unhealthy. And they were told, you know, stop eating McDonald's, even though they didn't eat McDonald's. <laughs> um, not that McDonald's is a terrible thing. This is just, you know, this particular doctor's hang up. Um, and, you know, just kind of leading her to this place of, of hopelessness and feeling like dealing with food in her body. And when she finally was connected with a therapist and dietitian who approached her treatment from more of a health at every size, weight inclusive lens, um, that was a huge turning point for her in her recovery. Um, and she specifically recalled like when her dietitian brought up, like, have you ever heard of health at every size? And she said that was kind of like this like gold nugget for her in this recovery process. You can see this rainbow and the pot of gold at the end. Um, and she also recovered one of or recalled one of her most powerful interactions with her dietitian, which was when her she had eaten ice cream for the first time. And she kind of confessed this to a diet, her dietitian, the way you might confess in like a Weight Watchers meeting or something. And instead of shaming her, her dietitian was like, oh, yummy, 
you ate ice cream? What kind did you have? Was it good? What kind is your favorite? And for her, that was a complete reframe for her from this place of shame to one of curiosity and um, finding joy in food again. Beautiful. And right, as you said earlier, such a simple intervention mm -hmm. to approach with non-judgment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like asking questions come with curiosity and not shaming or judging the food or the experience. And this is, again, just another one of some of the more positive experiences. This is actually from uh, Ari, the young Mexican uh, American patient who I told you about earlier, who was weight suppressed and not refed. Um, and despite some of those negative experiences in treatment, she actually painted her overall experience um, as quite positive. And so um, you can see here, this is an image of her therapist, her dietitian, and her medical provider. Um, and what I wanted to point out is in that bottom of the triangle tip at the bottom of the page, those are the client's knees and hands um, kind of folded. And I just wanted to point out how small she made herself in this image of her recovery process and how much the recovery process, or how much like her providers kind of took up space, how much space they took up in the page. Um, and I found that also interesting because also all of these providers are um, kind of white appearing women and, and she was a, a young Mexican American woman and it just, you know, highlighted for me again, sometimes the lack of representation that we have in the field and makes me wonder how much space our clients feel like they're allowed to take up, um, especially when they have multiply marginalized identities. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a really good point and interesting point in terms of to like the, the angles and how mm -hmm. so much of her is cut off. Um, mm -hmm. says the only provider that has a little bit cut off is this one over yeah. here. Yeah. And just one more image. I, I thought this was a, a kind of a series that this patient drew where she started out as when she found out about her eating disorder, she felt very alone. You can see that first owl, it says, I have an eating disorder and I feel all alone. Um, she was actually given a diagnosis, but not provided any treatment referrals due to her weight. Um, the second image of a, you know, her sitting on a perch with this Dr. Owl kind of yelling at her to continue to lose weight. And then this final image where she was connected finally with an eating disorders therapist. And in that connection, she it says heal, heal, heal all around that owl um, with this heart. So she felt connection. She felt rapport with her therapist and um, perhaps feeling connection around her disordered eating for the first time. And I think you mentioned, Erin, for this one, right? What, this might have been the client that was simultaneously diagnosed with an eating disorder and offered weight loss surgery. Uh, that was a different one, but uh, this, I would not have been surprised if this one, um, this one had also had that experience. We had another client who, while she was trying to, uh, um, uh, while her insurance was in the process of denying her higher level of care due to her BMI, she was pre-approved for weight loss surgery through the same insurance policy. Um, and obviously, you know, we would not want someone with atypical anorexia to be getting a weight loss surgery, particularly in, a, in an active phase of their disorder, but um, you know, you could definitely argue for maybe that's contraindicated, period. And I'm just gonna scoot through this, but just suffice it to say that it was difficult for higher weight clients to interact with lower weight clients in terms of feeling more isolated. You can see that there, me, the only fat woman in IOP, turns my exchanges into a new disordered eating. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, just kind of thinking about how complicated di different identities and those peer interactions can be for clients. Absolutely. All right, this is my last set of images, I think that I wanted to leave with us, but um, I just love this image of recovery. So what you can see here on the left is how recovery felt like in the beginning of recovery for this client. So you can see that she's kind of just squashed. You can see this little body squashed under all of these books. And, it, you know, the books are identity issues, attachment issues, 
shifted and misdirected emotions, 15 years of an eating disorder and dieting, relational drama and coping, joyful movement, meal plans 101, and haze and intuitive eating at the very top. And she's just feeling completely overwhelmed by them. And then in this image to the right, she said, this is where she's kind of moving towards in her recovery. You can just see how much more relaxed she is. She's sitting under a tree, kind of reading this book. The book says, um, uh, I think it's Choose Recovery. And then the stack of books is Health at Every Size and Intuitive Eating, Identity Development and Life. For this client, part of her recovery process was recognizing her biracial identity, which had really been stifled in her childhood growing up as her family really pushed her to lean into the white part of her identity and ignore the BIPOC part of her identity. Um, and then over by the trash, you can see meal plans 101, stifled emotions, diets and eating disorder. Um, so the things that she's kind of discarding, and I kind of titled this, take what works and leave the rest, right? Like what are the things that are forward leading for our clients in recovery? And what are the things that might actually unintentionally reinforce the eating disorder? Or maybe they're good for a time, like a meal plan, but you know, we don't want that meal plan to become a new eating disorder for a client. Absolutely. What a beautiful set of images to end on. So one of the things we wanted to leave everyone with too is, okay, great. We know there's a problem. So what are we, what do we do about it? Um, and these, it's obviously not an exhaustive list, but um, some kind of immediate go-tos that we recommend um, is having specialized ongoing training for both clinicians and milieu staff. This is not like a one-time thing. We are all living and breathing this. Um, so we need to keep challenging it over and over and over again and keep that on the forefront of what we're doing. Um, making repair. Okay, I would just, yeah. I would just say with that, like as issues come up in the milieu, right? Like as you see fat phobia, being able to check in as a staff um, to receive guidance on that in an ongoing way, really important. Absolutely. And making sure everyone feels comfortable being able to address that, right? I think one of the amazing things about group work and one of the things that's kind of harder for newer clinicians is like, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to come out of someone's mouth. So being able to feel like you're ready to respond if someone makes a comment that's potentially harmful to another client um, or just is needs some education um, in how to express ideas, right? Like one of the things that we've, we didn't really touch on, we just kind of jumped in, which I love, um, is using the word fat as a neutral descriptor. And so how do we teach that to clients? Um, how do we check in with clients and see how they're doing with the language that's used? And if like, cause inevitably we're going to mess up, right? Like we're going to have the best idea for group and it's not going to be <laughs> picked up well, or there's going to be an interaction where we try to address it in group and maybe we do it poorly. Uh, but being willing to step back into that space of repair and bring it back up and do the follow-up with the client. Don't just assume, okay, group is over, we're done. Um, but some like that repair work can happen on an ongoing basis and not just you know, when we, when we bomb, we return to it. I just had this happen in one of the clinical groups I lead last week, you know, where we did repair work the week after um, because I let some diet culture go unchecked in group and I shouldn't have. Um, so yeah, anyway. <laughs> and I think I shared with you, right? I had what I thought was an amazing idea for a body image group. A couple people felt really positively about it. Someone felt really negatively. It doesn't matter as much that like some people had a good experience. I need to attend to that client that was harmed by it. Um, own my part in that and figure out how do we re rebuild that trust and keep moving forward, um, which is going to be beneficial, like not that harming a client is ever beneficial, but being able to be someone who says like, wow, I really see that I did something wrong. I am sorry. I am going to take myself over here, work hard to do better and show up for you the way you need me to, because that's on me. That's not on you. Mm -hmm. So checking in on a regular basis, right? Not necessarily waiting for someone to come to us and say like, that didn't feel good. Um, making that kind of the norm, um, whether it's a group or an individual. 
And then I love this idea. This is from um, Scout Silverstein interrupting for justice and feeling comfortable being able to do that and saying like, oh, hey, I just noticed that might not feel good to to some people. Um, let's let's figure out what's going on here. Let's use some different language. Um, what do we need to talk about with what just came up? I added this one, uh, I'll tackle it. Um, but this idea of encouraging ide identity development across a wide range of identities while in treatment. So um, while in treatment, we can introduce our larger body clients to fat as a neutral word, to fat as a political identity, to um, different ways of embracing and accepting their body as it is right now, um, knowing that it might change in the future. Um, and that can be that uh, kind of owning that identity and um, can be really powerful in recovery. Um, I heard that multiple times from patients, especially at the larger end of the BMI spectrum. And kind of relatedly, um, these other issues of like coming to understand your gender differently or coming to understand your racial ide identity different. Many of our like biracial and multiracial participants talked about the importance of like accepting their racial um their more racialized parts of their selves and their experiences as really important to like accepting themselves in their bodies. Um, for some, this means, you know, figuring out sexual orientation or dealing with a new, um, uh, you know, neuro spicy uh, identification. And so just thinking about how we can strengthen identity development. Absolutely. And I'm glad you added this too, because I think I put it in my head as a given but decentralizing weight and care and integrating weight inclusive paradigms. So important. Yeah. And like, how can I as a therapist, primary therapist be an advocate for with a client whose primary care doctor maybe isn't eating disorder informed or is eating disorder informed and perhaps has a lot of weight bias, right? Like how do I advocate with and on behalf of the client if they're, if that's something that feels helpful to them? And I just want to point out with this too, like this isn't just for larger body clients. Of course. This is also relapse prevention for our thin bodied clients. You know, I am in my lived experience had a diagnosis of low weight anorexia earlier in my life and higher weight anorexia later in my life. And if I really wonder how my relapse prevention might have been if I'd been taught to make peace with fatness and size diversity earlier on in my recovery as opposed to you know, being reassured that I wouldn't get fat and, and then continuing to have that fear of fatness as a motivator in my disordered eating. And so relatedly, Absolutely. you know, encouraging um, renourishment for all, restoration for all. Um, and then that last point about diversifying our staff so that our staff can more um, fully represent the range of diversities of our patients. Definitely. All right. Um, this is our contact information. I'll leave it up really briefly. And then I'm going to see. Sorry, if... we talked so much, Kate. I know we're. <laughs> Love it. Um, we have I one question. So <laughs> Do you have any artwork by males and or can you speak to what you've learned about their experiences mm. as high weight patients? So um, thank you for that question. And unfortunately, in my recruitment for the study that I did, um, I was much earlier on in my thoughts on gender. Um, and so I had actually like specifically recruited uh, people assigned female at birth and trans and non-binary individuals. And I had left out um, males in the male experience. And if I could go back and redo what I did, I would do it differently. Um, absolutely. Um, at the time, I was curious about socialization of people who were assigned female at birth and how that led to potentially disordered uh, messages. And in in my narrow focus on that, I left out a huge swath of patients who have these uh, experiences as well. Um, Carter, the young trans black male who was in the study, didn't submit any artwork um, as part of his experience. Um, and so I do not have any uh, any artwork from males, and I apologize for that oversight and for that minimization that that does to the male experience for people who are already also marginalized within eating disorder treatment. Uh, 
spaces. I think it's a good point and right opportunity for for further exploration. Mm -hmm. um, as an art therapist, I'm very interested, right, and especially in how do we access art and creativity um, across different genders and perhaps some stereotypes of, of who makes what kind of art as well. Absolutely. Well, I think we are exactly at time. So I wanna thank you very much, Dr. Harrop, for taking the time to join us and share your amazing artwork and your ex expertise and experience with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was fun, Kate. Thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any questions or any issues with the platform, you can access that at CEGO um, and there's help available online for that. Thank you so much, everyone.